Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah, and I serve on our board of trustees here at Purpose Church. Whether you have been a part of our online community for a long time or just freshly tuning in, I'm so glad that you have chosen to join us in worshiping our Lord. There is something at our church for everyone at every age and every stage. So let us help you connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God by following our social media, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and checking out our website. Today, we continue our study through the book of Ephesians, exploring that God holds the blueprint for our lives. But before that, let me tell you a little bit about what's happening here at our church. We can all use more time with the Lord and with our church community, and our worship arts department wants to create space for us to do just that. Drop off your children in the nursery or at their regular midweek program on Wednesday, February 21st at 7 p.m. and come enjoy a night of prayer and musical worship as a church family. Just come as you are and see you there. We're thrilled to announce the upcoming father-daughter dinner and dance, bringing you a night of 50s themed fun. Dads, grab your dancing shoes and bring your daughter, granddaughter, niece, or if you are a father figure to a girl you love, bring her too. This will be an evening filled with good food, limbo, jump rope, and even convertible car rides. Be ready to kick off the night on March 1st in the event center at 6 p.m. and groove until 9 p.m. Space is limited, so register at purposechurch.com men today. There are many other ways you can partner with Purpose Church to further God's kingdom. To find these opportunities or to give online, go to purposechurch.com give. Now let's pray together as we continue to worship. Dear Heavenly Father God, thank you so much for today. We thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word, Lord. As we open up the book of Ephesians, I pray you open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, that we leave here feeling enlightened to your calling in our lives. Thank you, and we give you this time. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn. Till I met you. Jesus Christ. Breathing but not alive In all my failures I tried to hide But I couldn't do it It was my truth Till I met you oh, oh. Sing it out You call my name
Purpose Church, so sorry to not be with you this Sunday. Uh, Kimberly and I and the family are up in Seattle for uh, two of our grandchildren's uh, birthday party, so I'm surrounded by about 70 kindergartners and second graders. Uh, but I wanted to tape for you our annual Super Bowl quiz because I know how crushed you would be if we were to miss that today. Now, this is the one time at Purpose Church where it is okay to tear verses completely out of context. Normally, we frown on that kind of thing, but today it's okay. So here we go. How many of you uh, today at the Super Bowl are rooting for the Kansas City Chiefs? Let, let me hear you. Let me hear you loud. Okay, now we know that this is not just the Super Bowl. It is the Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey Bowl. So here, Chiefs, is your verse. Deuteronomy 28, verse 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth. All right, how many of you today in the Super Bowl and Taylor Swift Bowl are rooting for the San Francisco 49ers? Let me hear your voice. All right, great. Here is your verse, 2 Peter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false prophets among you, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. All right, finally, how many of you couldn't care less who wins the Super Bowl today? Let me, let me hear your, your voices. All right, well, here's your verse. 1 Timothy 4, verse 8. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Now, we have one more category uh, this year that I want to show to you right now and see if you fit into this category. You just hope both teams have fun. And I hope you have fun studying the book of Ephesians as we continue our series immeasurably more. The world seems to encourage spiritual exploration of all kinds. Even so, the more we use our own strength to find spiritual meaning, the further it seems to drift away. In the midst of this hopelessness, our God beckons us into His grace. He washes away the darkness and then brings us into the light. He guides us to embrace His transformative grace. He leads us to remain rooted in His unchanging truth, and He establishes us in His unconditional love. He shows us each day the blueprint of the plans He has for us. Through each aspect of our lives, God proves to us that He is immeasurably more. Hey, good morning, church. My name is Pastor Eric, and I get the privilege of serving in the local missions department. Today, I'm going to be um, sharing with you the word out of the book of Ephesians as we've been in this study, immeasurably more. I want to read to you um, Paul's prayer, the Apostle Paul's prayer for his people uh, and we'll jump in at Ephesians chapter three, uh, chapter 3, verse 14. And this is what the word of the Lord says. For this reason, 
I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and forever. Amen and amen. Well, thank you all for joining us here at Purpose Church. However you're connecting to us, um, those of you who know me, I'm a storyteller. And so I want to start this morning's time together with the story. Back in 2006, I was newer uh, to the city of Pomona and God had not too long ago wrecked my heart and totally transformed my life. And in light of this work, I had decided to surrender myself to him. And I had sensed God calling me in a radical way to leave all that I had known and to serve him with all that I had. And I felt him calling me to this community to serve in the city of Pomona, even though I was just a youngster myself. At that time, I started making connections. I started building relationships. And I also uh, was a part of church planning. And throughout this time, I ended up also bivocationally doing ministry. So I was working for a nonprofit in the community whose focus was on alternative sentencing. It was there where I began to meet and serve almost every juvenile offender that would step their foot in Pomona courts. Anybody that was system and justice impacted in the city, I got to, from a juvenile perspective, engage them and build relationships with them. And it was through this job, through this uh, experience, that I met a young man named Anson. Um, Anson was busted because... Uh, He had a drug habit and he got busted for theft. He was a very shy, meek young man. Um, And I really took a liking to him. You know, he he seemed really mysterious to me. So I started to build with him. And along the way, when I told him about community service hours uh, that were available to him, I told him, why don't you come to my church, right? And so this is actually Anson right here. Um, And so you could see back in the day, I had a chance to work with him. Uh, and do some fun stuff with him. And you could see I was a young buck back then. I looked like one of the youngsters that went on the camp with me. So Anson came to the church. He started doing his community service hours. And I realized that um, he had this love for music. He would be wearing headphones all the time. So I seized the opportunity. My love for hip hop helped me build a bridge with him. And I eventually got a chance to talk to him about an open mic night and, um, you know, a poetry event that I was going to be putting on. I sensed in my spirit that God was telling me prophetically, like he kept nudging me saying, this guy's got gifts. He's musical. There's something special about him. So I called that out in him. And to my surprise, he agreed to take part in that. And so he began to ride and we were dialoguing about his his art, and I was telling him, you can use it to express your pain and trauma, and you can also talk to God through it, right? And so the day of the event came, he presented his art, and we were all in awe at what he presented. I mean, he was so gifted. He blew us away. After that, time passed. Um, He finished his community service hours, and I never heard from Anson Um, until you fast forward about 12 years. And in 2018, right about the time when I started my nonprofit in this community, I received an anonymous donation in the amount of $10,000, $10,000. And it came at a time early on in the nonprofit development where it was so needed, right? A few days later, after that anonymous donation hit, I got a Facebook message and it was from Anson. And he began to tell me in our conversation that he was now a ghost writer for some of the best L.A. artists um, in the music industry. He spoke to me about the time that he had with me and how in that short interaction, I played a role to change his life. And not only was it the first time that I had challenged him to write and share his art, but it was the first time that he had begun to learn about Jesus. 
He now loves and serves Jesus, and he is a bright light shining in the music industry. And the $10,000 gift came from Anson. He tithed off of a recent project to my nonprofit, and he wanted me to know to reinvest in other young people like him. Man, what an amazing story, right? Which leads me to our main idea for today. And it's this, that God has a surprising plan for your lives. Hold on to that, man. God has a surprising plan for our lives. He chose you and predestined you in accordance to the pleasure of his will. And man, isn't that good news this morning? I don't know where you're at at this season of your life, but that, that gospel message, that good news sits really well with me for me to know that I'm chosen that he has had plans for me all along since the beginning when I was being knit and put together in my mother's womb. And to this day, God has plans for me and my life can be filled with his peace and his surprises. God has a surprising plan for your life, church. Let me talk to you a little bit about some context to the book of Ephesians. The author was the apostle Paul And he too knew that he was chosen and predestined. He was sent to this community, Ephesus, and it was a large city, just like the city of Pomona. Pomona's like the seventh largest city in LA County, right? It was an epicenter for worship for most of the Greek and Roman gods. And for over two years, Paul had an effective missionary presence in this community. Years later, after being imprisoned, by the Romans for his, mission, for his missionary work, he penned this letter to the church in Ephesus. And the book of Ephesians is broken down into uh, two halves, right? Somewhat broken down into two halves. The first half is what I'd like to call the gospel story, the gospel half. Paul talks a lot about in the book of Ephesians uh, about Jesus and what he has done and accomplished for us. And even more so, he talks about God's call to his followers, his call to a multi, multi-ethnic church and family. And the second half of Ephesians is how this gospel story should affect how we choose to live every part of our own life story. So I want to take a moment today and spend some time looking at the first half and some of the gospel elements of the book of Ephesians. The first part of the gospel, uh, the good news of Ephesians, if you would, is that God has an inclusive plan of salvation. In Ephesians chapter three, verse six, the word of the Lord says this, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel members together of one body and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. The Gentiles were once not included in this covenant relationship, right? It was only God's people, the Israelites, the Jews, but God made known this mystery to Paul at this time in history that his plan for salvation was for all people, including the Gentiles. And they are now heirs together, members together, and sharers together in the plan of salvation. Um, God's plan is to bless all people, all of his children. And yes, if you're questioning, I wanna tell you today, you are a child of God and he wants to bless you and he has a plan for you. Part of that plan is uh, what I'd like to hint to the uh, Isaiah 55 invitation. Um, So if you read that, if you go back and you read Isaiah 55, The prophet, he starts saying, come, come all who are thirsty. He repeats that phrase, come. It's this invitation to meet God, to know God, to taste of his goodness and his person and his character. God is faithful. He loves us. He has a plan for us. God's plan, according to his great love for you, was to send his only son, Jesus, to die for you, to make a way for you, to experience God's great forgiveness his great mercy, and his grace. And God is seeking you this morning. He is pursuing you. And if he hasn't gotten a hold of you uh, yet, don't worry because nothing can get in the way of God's plan. Nothing can interrupt or thwart God's plan. You know, as I was writing this sermon, I really felt this evangelistic call and nudge uh, as I was reading this book. If you're hearing this message today, 
and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, then I want to encourage you to come home. I want to encourage you to come to Jesus because he loves you and he has a great plan for your life. He wants to be in relationship with you and he wants to reveal himself to you in a way that you would know him intimately and that intimate knowledge of who he is would change everything in your life. I remember when I was in, in, in a season of life and I needed to hear that message that God loved me so much that he sent his one and only son to die a criminal's death, to shed his blood for the forgiveness of my sins. And then he rose from the grave and conquered death. And that same power that was at work in him is at work in me and can help me to walk holy and to live life with God. That was exactly what it, I, I needed to hear. And it starts with three simple words. It's sorry, it's please, and thank you. It begins with saying, Lord, in humility, I'm sorry for my sins that I have committed against you. I know I have not been perfect. Lord, please forgive me. Offer me that mercy and grace and forgiveness that your scripture speaks of. And it's thank you. It's thank you, God, for your son, the sacrifice of your son on the cross for me. Thank you for liberating me from my sin. Thank you for my salvation. And I want you now to come into my life, enter into my heart, take residence, and be the number one priority. And it doesn't just magically fix everything, um, but what it does is it's a beginning. And you can get next to people in community who are committed to walking with you. And that's the importance of being in the church, is having brothers and sisters who are on this journey together with you. Sorry, please, and thank you. It's my prayer that you come to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. The second good news of the book of Ephesians is that God calls the least likely. God calls the least likely. Look what Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8 says, and this is Paul speaking. He says, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. Paul knew, man, he understood that God calls the least likely. You might be asking this question, why would God choose me? And the answer is because that's the gospel way. It's because when people see God doing a miraculous work in your life, then there's no other conclusion that they could come to except that it must be God doing these changes in this person's life. You are the least likely. If you don't see yourself in the category of the least, then my prayer is that you would seek God in humility so he would help you to see yourself as a sinner who is in need of a savior to help you to see that Christ is that savior. And when you enter into relationship with him, he takes the least of these and he elevates them in a kingdom perspective and a kingdom way. And he begins to use their lives to bring him glory. If you feel low today, if you're feeling unworthy or unqualified, I say that's good because you're a perfect candidate to receive God's calling. I've seen God over the years of 20 years of ministry here in the city of Pomona, I've seen him take dope fiends, drug addicts. I've seen him take young people who are without hope, incarcerated persons, lifers, my unhoused friends, and he has totally transformed their hearts and their lives. Oh, what good news that is. The gospel news that God calls the least likely. Thirdly, we were once dead in our sins, but now we are alive in Christ. And I want to paraphrase Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. The scripture says, we were once dead in our sins and transgressions, but then it goes on to say, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, now makes us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. He brings us new life. The gospel is that he revives the dead sinner and he brings us newness every day as we walk with him. And all of this is done by grace. We are not saved, not by works of ourselves, but we are only saved by grace and grace alone. And this miraculous, transformative, redemptive, sal salvific work of Christ is only one that he can do.
It's only one that he can do, taking dead sinners and bringing us back to life. Um, One of the things I want to highlight, which transitions us to the next point, is it's only, this work is only done because of his great love for us. So we are now recipients of God's great love. And in Ephesians chapter two, verse four, once again, we see it because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, makes a way for us to be made alive again. And you're gonna hear me talk about this over and over and over again as you spend time with me, that we are so undeserving of God's love. We don't deserve his love. We deserve punishment. We deserve wrath. And yet we receive mercy, forgiveness, grace, and love. And this love, this Christ-like love, is a love that covers over a multitude of sins. And we see that in 1 Peter verse 4 and 8. It's not just the love that God fills us with, but in that same love, it trickles out horizontally so that every person that we interact with, we also are able to look over a multitude of sin in their life and and begin to continue to uh, share the love of Christ with them. And so, you know, it, it it comes vertically first from God, and then we offer it out horizontally to all of those that we interact with. It becomes contagious and infectious and it's extended to everyone, no matter color or creed. The next point here is that we are united. This is the good news of Ephesians. We are united into one multi-ethnic family of God. In Ephesians chapter two, verse 14, we highlighted a few things here. For he himself is our peace. In order for unity, we have to have peace, right? who has made the two groups one, Jew, Gentile, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, making two groups one, destroying the barrier, dividing the wall of hostility. When you read this book in its context, you understand that there was a ethnic, a racial divide. And you know, that's still true in our nation today. That's still true in our urban inner cities like Pomona today, there are genuinely racial tensions. And then if you take it even further into my life and my context, those uh, dividing walls of hostility, they exist between class, they exist between gangs. There's so many dividing walls of hostility, but the good news of the gospel, the good news of the book of Ephesians is that the gospel Jesus Christ has smashed those dividing walls and he now unifies two groups who were once enemies. And now we become family, brothers and sisters in the Lord, unified together as one. You know, this message is a message that this world needs to hear today, right now. The gospel is a message of love. It's a message of forgiveness It's a message of unity, the message of Christ. This world needs to hear this multi-ethnic gospel. This world needs to see it expressed because it's when those relationships are formed and unified when they see Christ, when they see his love. In Christ, our lives become surprising. In Christ, our lives become, I want to go as far as saying adventurous, or fun, or exciting. And so I want to transition and take us home with talking about our surprising life with Christ. What's surprising about our life with Christ? Firstly, I want to say, as we look into the scripture, we see that the mysteries of God will be revealed to us, his children, in prayer by his grace. Isn't that exciting? That the creator of all things wants to reveal himself to us, wants to reveal mysteries that are only in the manifold wisdom of his own self, right? His own being. He wants to reveal that to you and to me. That's exciting. That's surprising. I love what Pastor Claire preached on last week. She said, she, re- she referenced Isaiah 55. Um, verses eight through nine, where the scripture says, my ways, and this is God speaking to the prophet, my ways and my thoughts are much higher than yours. As high as the heavens are to the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts higher than yours and so much better than ours, right? 
Paul received the mysteries of the promise of salvation and how it would be extended to the Gentiles at this point in history. God also wants to reveal his mysteries to you and me. You may start asking like I did, well, what mystery is he trying to reveal to me? How about this? The mystery of the purpose of your life. The mystery of racial unity and what it takes to get there. The mystery of why you suffered significant trauma when you were a child and the purpose behind that. The mystery of your current circumstance. What are you trying to teach me, God? Where are you trying to guide me and lead me in this season? The mystery of the manifold wisdom of Christ. The mystery of his grace. You know, I work in uh, restorative justice work. And sometimes um, friends and colleagues of mine will say, man, Eric, how are you able to continue to forgive and work with people and show them so much grace. And they often will say, you just let them take advantage of you. And I'm real quick to say, hold up. No, I don't. Showing grace is not allowing people to take advantage of me. It flows from my relationship with Christ. Christ showed me grace when I was a repeat offender. And he never grew tired in that grace. And so it is my responsibility as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, to be gracious. And that grace has no limits and no bounds. And I have in prayer, by his grace, been able to understand more and more the depth and the mystery of that grace and how it plays out in my relationships with people. So God through this surprising life, wants to reveal himself and his mysteries to us as broken human beings. That's beautiful. He also wants to dwell in our hearts. Look at what Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13 says. The scripture says this, Christ, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And this is Paul in his prayer, right? He's praying that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And he prays that you being rooted and established in love, right, are willing to go anywhere and do anything in Christ's name. So I want to back up a little bit. Christ dwelling in the heart of the believer, that is a surprising truth that we find in the scripture, that we find in Ephesians chapter three. This is Paul's intimate prayer for his people that, that they would have an indwelling of Jesus Christ in their heart. Now, this word dwell in the Greek actually means to have permanent residence or to have a permanent home. Can you imagine that Christ can dwell in the heart of you and me? Can you imagine that our hearts, Christ wants that to be his permanent home through the Holy Spirit? For God, the creator of all things, to be present with us, making our hearts his dwelling place? That is a miracle. I remember when I first heard this truth and I first prayed this prayer as Paul was for others, I would say, Lord, I want you to dwell in my heart. I want you to be my number one priority. I want you to change my life. I want you to guide and lead me and keep me connected to my purpose in you and help me, Lord, to stay focused on kingdom matters. It's only because the indwelling of Christ that I've been strengthened to continue in my faith and walking with him. That's Paul's prayer for the people of Ephesus, and that's our prayer as pastors for the people of purpose. Our surprising life in Christ means that we would live a life of faith, that we would live a life strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at what Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 says. Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit, where? In your inner being. That he may strengthen you with power through his spirit. We live a life of faith as believers, strengthened by the power of the spirit of God. The same power that rose Christ from the grave is the same power at work in you and me. Church, I got to speak to you about this. So many times I see people that are moping around, Christians, they're moving without the power of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, we are sometimes ineffective in this dying and broken world. 
But if we would hold on to the surprising life that Christ is offering us, if we would hold on to and in faith believe that we have access to the same power that rose Jesus from the dead, we would move differently in this world. We would move in confidence. We would move in faith. We would move knowing that God can do anything that he wants to in and through us. We live a life of faith, strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're willing to go anywhere that God calls us to go. We're, and, and along the way, as we continue to say yes to him and move in his power, we must remain rooted and established in his love. Uh, this next picture that you're going to see on the screen is, is the picture of a, of a tree. When I was studying the passage um, and I began to read more and more about um, the height and the depth and the length, right, of the love of Christ. And you'll read that in the book of Ephesians in this particular chapter. For us to be rooted and established in that love, um, it's going to look a little bit like this, right? So as we grow and as we begin to walk with Jesus day by day, month by month, year by year, we should continue to grow deep into his love. And this is where it moves beyond a, a general understanding of God's love here that, oh yes, I understand God loves us, but it moves into this experiential love, right? We begin to be uh, overwhelmed by the love of God. Our understanding, we begin to grasp a greater understanding of how much God really loves us. You know, sometimes I look at my children and this is a good example that I refer to and I, I would do anything for them. I love them so much. And then I remind myself, that's crazy that that's nothing compared to the way that God loves us. As I live my life, as I root myself deeper in God's love, I become more established. My firm foundation is based on his love. And so it, it, it puts us in a position and in a posture in our lives where we can begin to walk out this surprising life that God has for us. We can begin to um, be uh, catalysts of change in this world. We can begin to be people who are bearing Christ's love everywhere we go. And so we become light in darkness. We become salt in this earth, right? Salt and light. You, you've read the scripture and how, you know, we stand out because of us going deeper in God's love. And then you see the fruit, right? The fruit that comes out of that. As we are rooted in God's love more deeper, as we establish ourselves more deeply in God's love, then our lives begin to bear gospel fruit. Um, the last thing, and I referred to it, is found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18. And this is my final prayer for you. Um, the scripture says, together with all the Lord's Holy people, Paul's prayer, right, is that we would grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. You notice that it says together with all the Lord's holy people. Uh, my last encouragement to you all um, before I end with a quick story is that, you know, we must grow deeper in our understanding of God's love together. And so the understanding gets more robust and, and more thorough because we're doing life together. And so we have to learn to love each other because we're going to offend each other very, very often. Um, and that goes with my next story and my last point, that God moves us towards a gospel racial reconciliation and oneness. And you're going to see some pictures on here. Um, you know, I came, I grew up in a, in a home where, you know, there was a racial tension that existed. My, my family, unfortunately, have a lot of hate and racism that exists. I'm saying my extended family. And so a lot of that rubbed off on me as I was growing up. But when I first came to the city of Pomona, I met this family. And if we can go back to the first picture. Um, and so this is Marissa and Aaron Hardy. These were brothers and sisters. And they were young bucks when I first hit the city. We entered into a beautiful relationship uh, I was mentoring them. We would have them over our home. We'd cook them dinner. 
they didn't have the greatest upbringing, and so they often didn't have anywhere to go. Their family was of working class. They would spend the night at our house in the summers. I mean, they were literally like my children, right? And so I was able to work through um, this, this racism that existed in my heart through the beauty of relationship. So this surprising life with Christ, it moves us towards this gospel, racial reconciliation and oneness. And so I went from, um, you know, having some hate and racism in my heart because of my upbringing to now having a familial bond with a family that's African-American. And the way this culminates is, as we go to the next picture, you'll see, um, you know, Aaron has had a child and Marissa has had a child. And Marissa, the sister, has asked Patty and I, my wife Patty and I, to be godparents to them. And so that's like a huge honor in my culture. um, You know, to be a godparent is a very important honor. And so for them to even ask us to do that, that's a very special thing. Um, I I will focus on this last picture. Aaron, um, his girlfriend and his child, unfortunately, were killed in a horrible traffic accident. Um, And they all three lost their lives. And so when that happened, um, me and my family were able to really come close to uh, Marissa and her family and really bring a lot of love and support and, and really grow rooted and establish more deeply in God's love together during a very difficult season in our lives. But, you know, I would never have been able to experience this, right, and share these stories if it wasn't for God at work in me. This, this surprising life, God is revealing his mysteries to me of his love and his purpose for racial reconciliation. And now I have the honor of being a grandfather. There's nothing, uh, there's no bigger blessing uh, than that that I can have. I want to remind you that we serve a big God who does the impossible. And in that process, through our temporal lives here on earth, we get to bring him glory. And that is our sole purpose. We serve a big God who can do the impossible. And as we move in that power of the spirit and as God is using us to accomplish his will here on earth, to build his kingdom, to reach others and share his love, all of that brings him glory. Let me say a prayer over you, church. Lord, I just thank you for your children. I commit to you their lives and I ask you that you would help them to to grow closer to you, rooted and established in your love. I pray, Lord, that we would remind ourselves of our identities, the good news, that we remind ourselves of the good news of the book of Ephesians, and we would hold on to these truths, and we would leave this place not the same. Thank you, Lord. Be with us. Strengthen us by your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Hey, Purpose Church. My name is Claire, and I am your student ministries pastor. Thank you for being a part of our online community. I invite you to follow our social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and check out our website so that you can stay connected to everything happening at Purpose Church. I hope to worship with you again soon.